How's it going? Welcome back to the show. Today we are going to be discussing gluten. We're going to talk about what gluten is, why it can be a problem for some people, why it's not a problem for most people, how to determine if you're one of those people that it can be a problem for, and a whole lot more. We are going to go deep into the science on this topic. I think this is an incredibly important topic because gluten truly can be a problem for some people. And for some people, it is negatively impacting their health and they're eating it and they don't know it. And hopefully somebody who's listening to this podcast may identify that it can be a problem for you. There's also probably a larger group of people who may be avoiding gluten or thinking that it's harmful to their health when in reality, you are perfectly fine eating it. So we are going to discuss the spectrum of reactions and non-reactions to gluten and also discuss some of the myths surrounding this topic because this is a very complicated and nuanced topic. And anytime a topic is complicated and nuanced, there's a lot of misinformation surrounding it because you can take half truths and you can exaggerate them because some people have negative reactions to gluten and it's very clear you can take that information and you can make it seem like everyone does and some people have done that and so I want to clear up the air all around and help those who are potentially having negative reactions to gluten understand and potentially limit or avoid it and also if you are limiting or avoiding it and you don't have a good reason for doing so hopefully this podcast will help you understand that and maybe you'll reintroduce it into your diet. So with that said, let's go ahead and get into the show. All right, so we're going to start by discussing what gluten is. So gluten is a protein. It is the main protein found in wheat. It's also found in rye and barley, but the primary source that most people consume most of their gluten is from wheat sources. So just like any other protein, gluten is made up of amino acids. When we eat gluten, our digestive system will break it down into amino acids, and those amino acids will be absorbed into our body and used for various needs throughout the body. This is like any protein. So proteins are made up of amino acids, they get broken down into those amino acids when we eat them, and they help to support our body's needs because these amino acids are used as building blocks to make neurotransmitters, to make hormones, to build new muscle tissue, to repair the gut tissue, and so much more throughout the body. So I want to emphasize that gluten is just a protein. It's not anything scary that's toxic, that's harming everyone's health. Sometimes it gets presented in that way. Just like any other protein, gluten can react to the immune system. Components of gluten, different structures of the proteins of gluten can react with immune cells in certain cases. This is the case with pretty much any protein. Now, some are more common than others. We can react to whey protein. We can react to proteins from fish, from shellfish, from nuts. Uh, there are reactions that we have that some people have to every protein in our food and gluten is one of those proteins that some people will have reactions to. We'll talk about the spectrum of the different reactions that people can have to the protein, uh, to the gluten protein. But uh, just, you know, putting that out there is that's just the way that proteins work. Uh, when we eat proteins, some people have just like we're, what we're going to discuss today for a variety of reasons, for, for genetic reasons, for digestive reasons, uh, for, for reasons for the health of, um, based on the health of their, their intestinal tract, they may have a reaction to a variety of different proteins from foods, and gluten is one of the more common proteins that some people react to. Now, why do people react to gluten more commonly than other proteins? So gluten is made up of the amino acids, primarily glutamine, and then also proline. Uh, so glutamine makes up about 30 to 50% of the amino acids, proline about 10 to 30%. There's nothing special here. Um, but what is special is the way that these amino acids are organized and structured. Um, it makes them slightly resistant to digestion in some cases and highly resistant to digestion in certain individuals who may not have the digestive enzymes to fully break down these proteins. Um, so when we eat uh, proteins, we need our enzymes in our intestinal tract. So when we eat, let's say we eat uh, a piece of wheat, we're gonna that's going to go into our stomach. 
our stomach's going to start producing acid. That's going to help to start kind of breaking down some of the food. And then that goes into our small intestine where it mixes with bile and pancreatic enzymes that are going to further break down those proteins into those amino acids. Our microbiome also assists with the breakdown of these proteins. And all of that together helps to break down these proteins into amino acids so that they can be absorbed into our system and be used for building blocks throughout the body. Now, with gluten protein, specifically, there's gliadin proteins. Um, so gluten is a variety of different types of proteins that have different structures and different types of gluten uh, have different structures of proteins. It's, it's incredibly complicated. Uh, but, but just to simplify it, there's certain structures in the gluten protein that can react with the immune system, specifically in individuals who have certain genetic mutations. So there's mutations in uh, genes that are of the HLA family. So human leukocyte antigen family, and there's the HLA uh, DQB1 gene HLA DQB2 gene. Uh, these are, if you have these, you're going to be more likely to have celiac disease. And this is where we're going to start to get into and start to discuss some of the uh, different types of gluten related uh, disorders or gluten related reactions or conditions. Um, so if you have these genetic mutations, your immune system is more reactive to these gliadin protein structures. And depending on the type of wheat that you're eating, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later, um, this the wheat that you're eating, you may be eating a whole lot of it. You may be eating uh, wheat that has higher amounts of these structures, and you have an immune system that is more highly reactive to these things, and you're not able to digest them well for whatever reason. Could be that your digestive system is not working as well, or you just have also a genetic predisposition to not be able to digest these these uh, gluten proteins as well, or your microbiome has um, shifted in a way to where it's not able to support the digestion of these gluten proteins as well, because your microbiome, as I mentioned earlier, also plays a role. Or another factor can be that your intestinal uh, lining, so the intestinal barrier. So in our intestines, we have we have a, a lining of cells and then we have a mucus layer. It's supposed to be this thick mucus layer that's meant to protect those cells uh, and create a barrier. And that mucus layer can get broken down. And when that happens, uh, that provides less protection for our intestinal cells. And that allows for the contents of our, of our intestines, the microbes, the bile, the stomach acid, uh, the the undigested food particles to come into contact with our intestinal cells and sometimes penetrate those intestinal cells and get into what's called the lamina propria, which is the layer underneath those cells in our intestines and interact with the immune system. And this can lead to uh, a more likelihood of some of these immunological reactions. Uh, so I know I kind of went into a little bit of detail there. Um, this is a little bit more than some people may know, but this was what one of the things that predisposes people to having these reactions because not everyone who has these genetic mutations will develop celiac disease. So there has to be other factors that come into play and some of these other factors that cause people to have to have a higher likelihood of reacting to these gluten proteins uh, have to do with digestive health, have to do with the ability to break down those proteins. Do you have the enzymes to properly break those down? Is your digestive system working properly? Or do you have the proper gut barrier in place? Do you have a healthy mucosal layer? These are the things that protect the immune system from undigested gluten proteins, along with exposure to microbes and other factors as well, uh, when we talk about the gut barrier. And all of this determines whether or not someone has a reaction to these foods. So you may understand as I'm discussing this, that food intolerances are very, very complicated. I'll probably do an episode soon specifically on uh, food intolerances. This is probably like the intro to food intolerances overall. Uh, I've discussed that previously, primarily focused on food allergies with Dr. David Stukas. 
He is an expert on this topic, and I'll link that episode in the show notes. Uh, that was mainly around food allergies. We also discussed intolerances, but I think it will be helpful to go into a little bit more detail about specific food intolerances, the types of intolerances people have, and intolerance reactions in general. But gluten is one of those intolerance reactions. This isn't technically considered an allergy to gluten when you have celiac disease. This falls under the spectrum of intolerance. Uh, reactions to various foods, which are very complicated. And they are more common in individuals with digestive and autoimmune conditions, uh, less common in healthy individuals, but they do exist. And again, we'll go into more, more detail about this on another episode. So if you have these HLA gene mutations, and then you have these other factors that come into play that cause you to be more likely to react to the gluten protein and you start to have a reaction to it when you're eating it and you don't know it because it's not this major negative thing and you're eating foods with gluten in every meal so you just feel bad after you're eating and you just get used to it and it becomes normal um, but you have a little bit of diarrhea and your GI system hurts a little bit after you eat and you're experiencing maybe some nutrient deficiencies where your hair is falling out a little bit you're tired a lot, you're having aches and pains, uh, this can be a symptom of a gluten-related, particularly celiac disease, but other gluten-related uh, responses can also contribute to, to things like this. But celiac disease specifically, if you have it and you're consistently eating it, it's going to cause these types of uh, reactions over time, and it could worsen into other issues and just cause a range of health issues that, that seem like they have some unknown cause and it's gluten causing an immunological reaction in your digestive tract that is breaking down what are called the villi of your intestines. This is called villus atrophy. These are these finger-like projections. Think of these like fingers that are projecting off of the surface of your intestinal lining. And the reason that we have these is because they increase the surface area of our intestines. So imagine a flat surface and then you put all these finger like projections on there and that allows for much more surface area for higher absorption of nutrients. So that increases the surface area of our intestines substantially by having these finger like projections. But when you're consistently eating gluten and it's causing these immunological reactions that leads to villus atrophy where these finger like projections almost completely disappear and that reduces the surface area of the intestines and reduces nutrient absorption. The damage that occurs to the villi can also impact the production of enzymes, which can further worsen the breakdown of these proteins, which can further worsen these reactions, which can lead to a cycle that just continues to worsen things. And this can happen with celiac disease. And the degree to which it happens in each person is going to be different. For some people, eating a little bit of gluten can cause major reactions. For other people, it's just a mild underlying thing that is causing problems for you that you do not recognize because it's not an extreme acute reaction. Like you don't eat gluten and have a major response every time. It's just breaking down the lining of your intestines and causing a minor inflammatory response that's damaging your intestinal lining, that's impacting nutrient absorption. Uh, and, and for many people, as I mentioned, there's going to be some diarrhea, potentially fatigue, uh, nutrient deficiencies, um, and maybe some GI pain usually. Um, and you're going to notice more symptoms when you eat gluten versus when you don't. And now it's important to do this in a very controlled way. I'll talk about that in a second. A lot of people make the mistake of you know, uh, blaming when they have a night out of eating pizza and drinking on gluten. Um, you have to, if you're going to try to determine whether or not gluten's causing a response, you have to do it in a very controlled way. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second, but first I want to discuss how to determine if you have celiac disease. Uh, so there's a blood test called a TTG IgA test, tissue transglutaminase IgA test. You can ask your doctor to test you for that. I would recommend this is not healthcare advice. It's not medical advice. So disclaimer, uh, recommend talking to your doctor, seeing what type of testing you can get. That uh, test is a blood test that is a pretty accurate blood test. It can help you uh, rule out pretty well whether or not you have it. Now, if you're having very clear symptoms of 
celiac disease, you take gluten away and you're not having symptoms, they go away, you bring it back in, they're extreme. Um, and you want to go further than that, you can, there's other types of testing. Again, talk to your doctor because there's tissue biopsies, more comprehensive things. Uh, but just that, that one TTG IgA, tissue transglutaminase IgA, is one that can determine pretty effectively whether or not you're having these gluten-related uh, immunological reactions. Um, and so we talked about celiac disease. Now, there's a that, that affects about 1% to 2% of the population. So it's a very small percentage of the population, but I know that there's thousands of people listening to this episode, and there's several of you who are in this boat, and some of you may not know it. Uh, there's also another 5 to 10% of the population who experience what's called non-celiac gluten sensitivity. This means that you don't have celiac disease, but for whatever reason, you're having a reaction to gluten. Could be that you're not digesting the protein well, and even though you don't have the genetic predispositions for the uh, more pronounced immunological responses that lead to the villus atrophy and the damage to the intestines, your immune system's not reacting to it well for whatever reason, or it's not digesting well. And when you eat gluten, you have a negative response to that gluten protein. Now, unfortunately, there's no way to determine whether or not this is occurring for you. There's no blood test to determine this. There's, there's no testing for it. The only way to determine it is to test it in a elimination and reintroduction in a very controlled fashion. So the way that I typically recommend for people to do this is I would do pasta because pasta is high in protein, high in gluten. So if it's a wheat source, if it's like bread or pasta and it's high in protein, it's typically going to be high in gluten. So pasta usually has seven grams of protein. That's a decent amount of gluten. I would do a gluten pasta and a gluten-free pasta and make a meal that you normally are, are used to having if you do have pasta meals on a regular basis and you are used to tolerating well or or if not just make a new meal very simple try to keep it as simple as possible um, have pasta in one meal with gluten and then without it in another meal and test it a couple of times and try to determine if you are experiencing any negative responses pay attention are you having bloating are you experiencing joint pain are you getting headaches? Are you tired when you have the gluten? It's best if someone does it for you where they are making the food for you and not telling you. Um, it's hard to do that, but it would be ideal. There was a study that was published in 2017 where they compiled the results of studies that looked at uh, participants who were suspected to have non-celiac gluten sensitivity and they were put through a blinded challenge, meaning that someone else gave them the food and they gave them either gluten or something else. And they found that only 16% of the participants actually reacted to gluten uh, consistently in the way that was expected, like in, in the fact that they probably did have non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Um, and then 40% of people thought that they had uh, negative reactions to some of the other. 40% of the people reported reactions to the placebos, uh, which they're not supposed to be reacting to, um, suggesting that a lot of people are believing that they're having gluten reactions, but they're really not. And there's a small percentage of people who are actually having these, these non-celiac gluten sensitivity reactions. And so it's important if you think you might be having it to uh, properly test it to make sure that Okay, yes, I am really having these reactions and it's probably good to limit or avoid gluten. Now, if you are having these reactions, uh, that doesn't mean you have to completely eliminate gluten from your diet. It's more likely that you're more likely to have reactions based on certain things. For example, um, if you're more stressed, if you have less sleep, if your diet is poor overall, and you can determine how much gluten you can include in your diet and how you can include gluten in your diet so that it doesn't have a negative impact on the way that you feel. Because as I always mention, uh, nutrition is not black and white. There's a gray area and there could be circumstances where something doesn't do so well for you under certain conditions and perfectly fine under others. And the reason I say this is because I've worked with a lot of clients primarily with digestive and autoimmune conditions and I've had them do food journals and I've seen this over and over again of uh, for example, one particular example is I had a client who she would have a bagel, which is very high in gluten. They often have 10 to 13 grams of protein. It's gluten protein. And she would have a bagel and go run. And then she would get nauseous, have negative reactions to it. But if she had a bagel with 
without running, she was fine. And that's because running can increase intestinal permeability. It's a very high level of stress in a short period of time. It's one of the things that can increase intestinal permeability more than anything else. And it does it for a short period of time, uh, intestinal permeability. And I need to do a whole episode on this, actually. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this right now, but intestinal permeability is what is often referred to as quote unquote leaky gut. And that means that your intestines, that mucosal layer breaks down a little bit in the cells of your intestines. And if you have gluten proteins that aren't fully digested, that are crossing uh, the cells of your intestines, that can more likely lead to negative reactions. Now, there could be other reasons uh, that would explain these reactions. For her, she could tolerate bagels in various times, but not during that time. Sometimes you have to keep a food journal um, to help you to piece this information together. As I mentioned, this is what I do with my clients who have these digestive and autoimmune conditions where there's they're more likely to have these intolerance reactions. It really helps to keep a food journal, keep your foods pretty consistent sometimes, simplify your meals. So not having, you know, an acai bowl with flax seeds and mixed nuts and uh, a variety of different types of berries and uh, all of these different things in it where there's 20 different ingredients that that's not bad. That's actually, I make that for my son for breakfast, similar to that. Uh, it's not a bad thing, but if you're having negative reactions to foods and you're trying to dial in what type of reactions you have, it really helps to simplify things. So, uh, that's a tip. If you're trying to figure out whether or not you're having these reactions, it's kind of simplify your meals so that you can identify what foods are and aren't triggering you. So simplify your meals and then and then rotate out the foods and just make one change and say, okay, I had this meal on this day and then I had this meal on this day. I changed one thing. Is there a difference? And then you got to track some data over time. So uh, that's really the only way to figure out uh, with non-celiac gluten sensitivity and pretty much any uh, food intolerance is to eliminate and reintroduce under controlled conditions and keep a food journal, simplify your meals if you're trying to really identify these intolerance reactions because they can be a problem. So non-celiac gluten sensitivity can exhibit a lot of the same symptoms as celiac disease uh, to a lesser degree, uh, to a much lesser degree. It's not going to compare. Um, there's not nearly the degree of immunological reactions and sensitivity that we see with individuals who have celiac disease, who have that genetic predisposition. But, but those who have non-celiac gluten sensitivity will still often report headaches, brain fog, fatigue, joint pain, digestive issues, diarrhea, and often will experience benefits when they limit gluten in their diet or remove it. Um, and in my opinion, you don't need to completely eliminate it. If you don't have celiac disease, you can still include it in your diet, but limit it and find that threshold that works for you that doesn't cause you any symptoms. And the reason that I'm saying this is you don't really just want to avoid gluten for no reason, because then you take breads and pastas and other uh, tasty foods off the table. And I know a lot of people associate these foods as negative because they're rich in carbohydrates and they're quote unquote processed. But these are delicious foods that have been included in our diet for hundreds, if not thousands of years and eating a whole wheat, high fiber, uh, pasta, for example, is not going to have a negative effect on your health. Not only can these things be delicious, but there's a lot of nutrition in a whole wheat product, and we don't want to avoid them for no reason. Another thing that I want to discuss in terms of reactions, because this is another thing that often gets uh, confused for a gluten reaction, and this is FODMAP-related reactions. And this is another topic that I'm going to make an episode on in the future. I've discussed this topic, FODMAPs, uh, a bit in the fiber episode, if you want to go back and check that one out. And in any time I mention a past episode, I highly recommend just going to thenutritionsciencepodcast.com and then using that search bar at the top right, and you can search. You type in fiber, you'll find that fiber episode, and that's the easier way to do it. I'll post these in the show notes as well, but anytime you have a topic that you want to learn more about, that's an easy way to dig into the archive of episodes. The reason that I bring this up is because if you're eating a food that has gluten, you're probably eating a food that has high amounts of FODMAPs. And FODMAPs are carbohydrates that can be fermented uh, by the microbes in our gut and can contribute to IBS symptoms for some people. And there's a lot of people who are mistaking FODMAP reactions for gluten reactions. And it's helpful to know what you're reacting to and to understand whether or not it's 
a reaction to all FODMAPs or just gluten. Again, I talked about FODMAPs in the fiber episode. So if you don't know what they are, I highly recommend going and listening to that. And I'm going to talk about them more in a future episode as well. But that is an important distinction. So if you are reacting to things like beans, broccoli, and other high FODMAP foods, and you can just Google high FODMAP foods. If you find that you're reacting to all those things, it could be that that's the issue and it's not gluten itself, but you're just reacting to FODMAPs. And when you eat bread, bread has a lot of FODMAPs and that's the issue. So it's important to understand that the FODMAPs are the issue because what a lot of people do is they take away gluten and they're thinking it's going to have this major benefit, but they're still eating a lot of high FODMAP foods and they don't experience any benefit. So that is very common and it's very important to distinguish if you think that you're having those reactions. The last thing that I want to discuss is the differences in gluten in different types of wheat, because this is something that I've seen people post about and there's truth to it. So people will say, I was able to eat gluten in Europe and I cannot tolerate it in the United States. And usually when you see people post that type of stuff, it's just nonsense. But in this case, gluten actually is different. The wheat varieties are different. Not gluten is different. Well, gluten is actually different a little bit too, uh, but the wheat varieties are different in the United States where they are higher in gluten, they're higher in protein, and we have what's called a hard red wheat variety that makes up the majority of the wheat in the United States, whereas the wheat produced in Europe is a softer variety that has lower amounts of gluten. So if you can eat bread there and you can't here, it could be because there's lower amounts of gluten. There's also potentially different types of gluten proteins depends on the type of wheat that you're getting specifically because there's so much variety in the very specific proteins. But overall, if we look at like just the differences in the food supply, they have a softer variety overall of wheat that they're using in their foods. And that softer variety is lower in gluten. So it could be that could also be that you're eating less processed food, that you're on vacation, that you're less stressed, that you're moving more, uh, that you're just having a good time overall and, and you know, just eating more mindfully. Like there's a lot of things that can contribute uh, that isn't just gluten, but some people will experience that they have reactions in the U.S., but they don't in Europe, and that could be a big factor. Again, the food supplies are also usually a lot fresher, a lot less processed in Europe, so that could also be a factor, but the gluten having lower gluten amounts in the wheat could also be a thing. And if you are someone who thinks you might be sensitive to gluten, uh, but you still want to continue eating wheat, you don't want to cut it out of your diet, you might want to go for some of these uh, softer varieties of breads that have lower amounts of protein. And that might be a better option that you tolerate better as well. Another thing that I want to mention, and I don't want to go into too many tangents, but this is like I mentioned, this is a very complicated topic. There's also individuals who might experience what's called a non-celiac wheat sensitivity that isn't from gluten. Now, I mentioned these food sensitivities are very complicated. Uh, wheat has what are called amylase tryptase inhibitors, and these can potentially inhibit digestive processes in some individuals and may also be responsible for some of the intolerance reactions that people experience when they eat wheat. This is another one of those things that you will only know if you're eating wheat, you'll experience some negative digestive responses. And that's the only way to determine if you're having this type of negative reaction. But there's a spectrum of reactions that people can have to wheat. And it's a small percentage of the population, but it's occurring. And if you think it's occurring for you and you're eating a lot of bread and pasta and things like that, it can be helpful to try to identify, maybe eliminate, remove those things, see if it's impacting your health because it might potentially be a problem for you. But most people are perfectly fine eating gluten and wheat. I eat these things on a regular basis and I've gone through this process of eliminating it, of reintroducing it, of seeing how I felt not eating it and eating it. It makes no difference for me. I've had many, 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 many clients do the same thing, even clients with digestive and autoimmune conditions who have been told they could never touch gluten ever again, who are perfectly fine eating it. And at the same time, I've also seen those who cannot tolerate it at all, who's health is completely damaged by consumption of it. This 
is why nutrition is so incredibly complicated. This is why a lot of this misinformation persists because there's so much nuance to these topics. I went way longer than I expected on this podcast, but as I mentioned at the beginning, this is a complicated topic. So let's do a quick overview of the topic of gluten. So gluten is a protein. Gluten is a protein that is made up of primarily glutamine and also proline. Now the structure of gluten makes it somewhat resistant to digestion in some people, and there are some individuals who have a genetic predisposition to having an extreme immune response to gluten consumption. And those individuals will sometimes develop what's called celiac disease, which affects about one to 2% of the population. There's also some people who don't have celiac disease, but don't tolerate gluten for a variety of different reasons, or don't tolerate wheat for a variety of different reasons. This probably represents about 5 to 10% of the population estimates. It's very difficult to pin down exactly how many people are experiencing this. Those individuals don't need to completely eliminate gluten, but may benefit from limiting or avoiding it in some cases if they have a more pronounced reaction to it. The rest of the population, which is probably 9 out of 10 people, most of you listening, are completely fine consuming gluten, don't really need to worry about it, it's just a protein that's found in some pretty delicious foods that can help to meet your amino acid needs. It's absolutely nothing to be scared of. So I hope this episode of the podcast was helpful. If you enjoyed it, some of the best ways to let me know would be sharing it to your social media and tagging me, leaving a review for the show, or leaving me a message letting me know you enjoyed it. The best place to do that would be on Instagram. You can follow me there if you're not following me already, at Dr. Adrian Chavez, DR period, Adrian period Chavez. And I would be happy to hear from you. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Nutrition Science Podcast. I hope you have a great day and we will talk soon. 